Okay, we had, oh, Jerry's here, welcome. Okay, we had two events today. I thought they were both a Kiddush Hashem. And that's what we're talking about, right? We're talking about spirituality. And spirituality, again, is one of these vague terms, and we're in the midst of discussing how, um, how to live a spiritual life. And, and we're in the context of three elements of leading a spiritual life. Ben Adam Lechavero, which is uh, interpersonal, Ben Adam Lemako, which is moral, and then Ben Adam Laatzmo, which is intrapersonal. But before we get into, we've already talked about Ben Adam Lemako, between us and God, what I want to talk about tonight is hopefully Ben Adam Laatzmo, and perhaps also Ben Adam Lechavero, which is interpersonal. But before we do that, I want to talk about two, the two events that I experienced today, and how each one is a Kiddush Hashem, each in his own way. Okay. Um, in no particular order, we'll start, I guess, with the happier one. The happier one is uh, today's uh, event at the Kahila, celebrating Barry Steiner's 80th birthday, or as Mitzi said, the beginning of his eighth decade. No, of his 80s, the beginning of his 80s. Okay. I guess his ninth decade. And the speeches that we heard from people of all different kinds of backgrounds, really spoke to his menschlichkeit. And I was especially, especially noticed and impressed by those who talked about how Barry never got upset or never gets upset. And you've never seen him say a bad word about anybody. And it doesn't happen by accident. It really, it doesn't happen by accident. It happens because he works on himself. It's not just he was born with a, fantastic nature and he just goes with the flow but he he's had reason to be upset with people and he knows how to bite his tongue and that's really gavura so that's that's one sort of kiddush hashem when you talk about a person's life hashem should give him the strength to continue for another 40 years to 120 uh, to be in good health mentally physically in every possible way he should have nachas and Hashem, and he should merit to walk his grandchildren down to the chuppah. Be'ezrat Hashem. That, you know, when you see a life, a life led like Barry's, where it's really just tremendous Kiddush Hashem. It's really impressive. It's really, really inspiring. So that's one sort of Kiddush Hashem. And that's one life of spirituality, if you will, that I, that I learned from today. The second type of Kiddush Hashem today is one that's much, much more painful to talk about. And that is, um, I guess I'll start with a phone call. Um, not asking you for your feedback right now. I know everyone's gonna be very impacted by what I'm about to say. Immediately after Shabbos, she got a, Shandy got a phone call on her cell phone. Which is very unusual, very, very unusual. The phone call was from somebody who she works with saying about another person that this particular woman's baby went to sleep Friday night, 15 months old, and didn't wake up Shabbos morning. It's a horrible, horrible story. Really horrible story. And, um, and Shandy immediately, um, I mean, I called the Rav, I called the Rav, Rabbi Langer, who's the family Rav. And I said, you know, my wife is very close to, to her. Do you think it'd be appropriate for her to come over tonight? I, I can hear, you can hear both ways. It all depends on the people involved. Some people mean well and run over there, but it's not the right thing. So I wanted to make sure it was the right thing. And he said, 100% she should please come. Turns out that her name is Bela, this woman. Turns out that she, someone had, they asked her on Shabbos, the Hatzalah members on Shabbos asked her, is there anybody that we can, you know, come and keep you company? She said, well, Shandy Stewart, but she's probably not here for Shabbos. She's probably in Westwood. And um, so Shandy went over there last night for a few hours. Today we had her children. The reason why Shandy wasn't at the event really today, although she stopped in to wish, you know, wish uh, Mazel Tov, but she had, her, she had this woman's children, her four other children, Can I know her, um, for the morning till around two o'clock this afternoon. And as a literal, it's a real, it's a literal nace, a miracle. When a child, uh, God forbid, dies at home, whether it's SIDS, whatever it might be, yesterday the police were there, the detectives were there, 
You can imagine the balagan going on. The coroner takes the body. To get the, to get the baby released from the coroner involves a tremendous amount of, of political legwork, uh, effort, um, and usually, and we've had cases in the past, unfortunately, it takes a few days. You have to get, A, the coroner has to agree, B, the uh, health department, which closes, the emergency health department closes at 1230 on Sunday. And then of course the baby needs a tahara, which doesn't take a long time, but it takes some time. And you also have to have a cat, you know, the casket has to be in stock. It's, it's not a simple, it's not a simple, simple uh, uh, process. And the funeral was today at three o'clock on a Sunday. And that itself was a miracle by itself. And the various people who spoke at the funeral, so obviously you can imagine what they said. You know, it's not that much to say about a baby, but to talk about our emuna and our bitachar and our faith and trust in Hashem. And as, as, as it's not easy for a rabbi or the, the Rabbi Goldberg, Rabbi Shlomo Goldberg, who is, the, uh, who is his boss, because he's a third grade rabbi at, at Aureliahu, for him to talk about it is, is moving and it's deep. And to hear his father-in-law speak about it, Emun Ambitachon, is moving and it's deep. But to hear the baby's father speak in the way that he spoke, it's a moment that I hope I take with me for the rest of my life. This is a guy in his late 20s, he's much younger than me, in his late 20s, holding at such a high spiritual level, and the way that he's able to speak about God at a moment like that, and, and I wish I couldn't even tell you what he said, and I can't, I can't, or maybe now's not the right time for it. But in, in Yiddish, there's an expression, which means it's just words at a whole nother level. It's just a whole nother existence, a whole nother plane of being. And it was a privilege to be there. And if it was sad and it was heartbreaking, but it was a privilege to be there, to be part of that, uh, of that experience, to see a father speak in such a way where his, he exudes his bitachon. As Chazanish famously says that emuna is theoretical, academic belief in God, and bitachon is living the life of faith that when things either go our way or don't go our way, we attribute them to God. And what he saw was living bitachon. That's spirituality. You want to know what it is to be spiritual? That's spirituality. That's it. It's not being in a forest and meditating, not listening to incredible music, not feeling good about yourself in the moment, that's Kedusha. That is Ruchnias. And that was, and that obviously doesn't come by itself in a vacuum. That's because of a, this is a couple who have worked together and before they met even on themselves. And it was just an incredible, incredible time. And then Shandy and I went to the Bay Salem, we went to uh, Mount Carmel on Gage, and we Participated in the burial, and then we got home, and we then we we had their kids once more, and I just dropped them off at their house now. But that's that's really that was a mind that was an experience that uh, I hope to take with me. It's a it's a growth a growth moment, if you will. Those are my two experiences today that I wanted to share with you, that are are to me. That's kedusha. That's ruchnias. That is just. Obviously, we prefer the first type. We obviously prefer the first type. Um, and Bezan Hashem, that's what we should always experience, which is the good times. Okay. So, I'm not really inviting comments. Obviously, it's horrible and sad. Uh, if anybody wants to know how they could be helpful, um, we, you know, I'll, I can let you know afterwards. I, I, I gave a class on Friday at Maimonides for the eighth graders. And this class, it was a Holocaust class. They have a, a beautiful, not beautiful is the right term, but a very moving Holocaust hall. It's not one exhibit, it's different kinds of exhibits, but they're not things to look at. It's, um, it, it's places, uh, it's, it's a place to visit. It's, you visit the ghetto, you visit a shul in Eastern Europe, 
It's a very, very impressive. They call them sets, I believe. And, um, and my job this past Friday was to speak about the Jewish perspective as opposed to the Nazi perspective. The Nazi perspective was, I believe it's called eugenics. Eugenics essentially said that anybody who's a little bit different is not worth keeping alive. And the way that I opened the class was in speaking about my tehila and her birth and her special needs and her development or the lack of her development. And I talked about how if Tehillah had been alive in 1939, she would have been one of the first ones killed by the Nazis. And that of course was the Nazi approach to people who were different and people who were, um, who had different sorts of needs. But the Jewish people believe, and we talked a little bit about this a few weeks ago, we believe that we are all created with Selim Elohim. We're all created in the image of God. And the Tzalem Elohim, of course, means on the one hand that we have free choice. But beyond that, the Tzalem Elohim means that we all have a godliness within us, which means that we have the unlimited potential or limitless potential for greatness. And so we begin tonight talking about Ben Adam La'atzmo, personal growth as a means of attaining a spiritual life a journey of leading a spiritual life. So when it comes to personal growth and character refinement, you know, we think, oh, we're born this way. Uh, we're born with without much patience. We're born with a quick temper. We're born with a stinginess. We're born with a, with a, uh, with a, gener a generous nature. And you see it, right? You see kids. I remember when I was in yeshiva, I had a roommate. This is when we were in the mirror. My first dira, my first apartment in the mirror, we had 11 bachram together. Can you imagine? 11 guys between the, around all 19, 20 years old, uh, two showers, a couple toilets, two or three bedrooms, 11 guys piled in. I'm not sure what we were thinking. I don't think we were thinking. It was a terrible idea. When we all shared one landline, this is before cell phones. And of course, people want to be able to call America. Well, there was one guy who had said, I never used a phone. I'm only paying, you know, X percentage. And, um, and what he did was he, um, and what he did was he, he went through the, the phone bill, which was 11 pages long of tiny print. Remember those phone bills? And he would read through it. Now, now everybody has unlimited free, so like, you don't, no one bothers with this, right? But um, he read through the, and he highlighted all of his expenses, all of his calls, and then he added them together and he paid five shekel and 63 agarot. And that was his thing. And I said to him, let's say his name was Yaakov. I said to him, Yaakov, like, why do you have to be so cheap? We're talking about five, ten dollars here. We're not talking about a lot of money. He goes, I'm not cheap, I'm thrifty. Okay. Today he's made partner in a law firm. He lives in Lakewood, New Jersey, and he, um, he works in the law firm in Manhattan, and, um, and he has become a very generous person with his money in helping many people with tzedakah, or Hashem. We're not stuck with our nature. It may be harder, more challenging, more difficult than others, whatever, whatever our challenge is, but we're not stuck with it. The greatest thing about leading a Jewish life is knowing that were created by Tzalmelukim. And by the way, Jews and non-Jews are both have Tzalmelukim, right? Because Adam, Adam was the one who was given the Tzalmelukim. But the great, the greatness of our teachings is that we have the capacity to develop. And as the Vilna Gon says, the purpose of our life is to develop. That's the whole purpose of life. And so when it comes to Ben Adam La'atzmo, personal growth and knowing When it comes to our personal growth and knowing that we have potential to become great people, it's not just Barry Steiner, and it's not just this couple that, um, it's not just uh, um, you know the couple that I referred to earlier. And Andy, thank you so much for what you wrote. It's exactly, uh, Maimonides is raising money and that's one of the purposes. So uh, I'll, I'll definitely put you in touch. Thank you so much. 
and with regards to um, with regards to um, the cheap thrifty comment was used in an excellent movie. Um, I can promise you, he never saw that movie. <laughs> I can, yeah. Uh, I'm willing to bet. <laughs> okay. So, I want to read a passage from Rav Shimshon Pincus. Rav Shimshon Pincus is a uh, uh, of, of blessed memory. He was a, an American rabbi. His joke was he was illiterate in three languages, or he wasn't. He was. I don't know if illiterate is the right word. He read three languages, but he couldn't speak any of them. Uh, he he spoke, he, you know, Yiddish, Hebrew, and English, but his his speech was a, a mishmash of all three together. And if he had to speak only one, he wouldn't be able to manage it. But it, uh, nonetheless, he was a special person, extraordinary person, really, um, who was a rabbi, American born, uh, American born, um, in uh, and, and lived in, in a place called Ofakim, which is in the south of Israel. It's the North Negev, but it's the south of south of Israel. And he says like this. I actually heard, I heard him give a talk one time. He, he tragically was killed in a car crash um, in Israel. Uh, but uh, an extraordinary person. And during his lifetime, he published, I think, I think three Svarim, two or three Svarim. And posthumously, they've, from his talks, they've published maybe, I don't know, 50 Svarim, something like that. An extra, very, a prolific speaker, um, although his writing never quite caught up while he was alive. So he says, what sort of greatness can a person achieve? And he talks about this, this um, sort of binary perspective that Judaism offers us, you know, guf and neshama. When our body with its desires, because of course body is related to the physical, stands on one side and our soul stands on the other side. What level of greatness can we reach as a result of the essence of the soul that God placed in every person? To what exalted level can the soul within us bring us? I apologize for this translation, it's not mine. What he means to say is, we have a goof and we have a neshama, but we're being pulled in two directions, up and down, we'll call it. So if we're pulled like that, so what can we really accomplish? What greatness can a person achieve? So he says, if a person were to examine even the simple meaning of the verse, Vayipach be'apav nishmat ruach chayim, that God blew a nishmat ruach chayim, a living soul, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, into Adam. And, and I have no idea what that is. Um, you're distracting me. Okay. Um, if a person examines that pasuk, he blows from himself. Because I'll say, when one blows, you blow from yourself. What does that mean? It's kind of scary, right? You, you, you're talking to somebody and he shares of himself with you. You know, it's like secondhand smoke. It's like you get the secondhand version of a person, so to say, right? When he blows into you. So he says, this means that the soul that God blew into us has a point of holiness as if it were from him. This is kind of a, this, so far he hasn't taught us anything really new. This is a classic sort of teaching, isn't it? That God blew from himself into Adam. So he blew his soul, so to say, into Adam. So he says, therefore, by nature, every Jew, no matter who he is, who she is, can reach infinite greatness. That's the simple meaning of the text. We possess a sacred soul. And that means that God gives a piece of himself, as it were. It's not just that God said we should have a soul. Not God said, oh, I'm creating souls and giving them to you. No. What is a soul? A soul is, an, is the essence of God. We're godly. And therefore, our very nature is that a person can attain boundless greatness in Torah, in prayer, fear of heaven, service of God. And if God gave us a holy soul, he gave it to us so that we should use the power it contains. Like it says in Mishael Sisharim, how important and desirable is it then that we recognize the greatness of the soul within us? As a result, we will value and appreciate it. And consequently, we will know how to use its powers to our benefit throughout our days. So the idea being that if we can appreciate our soul, and we'll see, soon see, hopefully, how this is connected to self-development and self-growth. 
I mean, already we can say, if your soul has a, an aspect to it that's limitless, so then that means that we're not limited. And if we're not limited, then we can change. If we can change, we can grow. If we can grow, we can make something of ourselves. Now, Yetzirah, or evil inclination, evil impulse, evil urge, the devil. No, I don't know about that. But Yetzirah, of course, is not entirely a bad thing. The Medrash tells us, now, because some would say, oh, the Yetzirah is the source of poor character traits. Or it's the part of me that, that makes, you know, drives me towards turning on those uh, those poor character traits, or if you want to be scientific about it, I have synapses in my brain, electrical connections that fire. And so when I think one way or I think another way, I'm building connections. So am I building growth or am I building destruction, if you will, or am I destroying? So the Medrash says that if the evil inclination did not exist, a man would not build a house, he would not marry a woman, he would not produce progeny, nor would he conduct business. The Yetzirah is a vital force that keeps the world running properly. The thing is that its drives must be channeled into productive endeavors. How do you do that? Through the study and fulfillment of the Torah, of course. What does that mean? Chazunish, Chazunish used to say, there's no such thing as bad midot. No such thing as negative character traits. What does he mean? He means that character traits are character traits. Thriftiness, and generosity. Should a person be so generous that they spend all their money on one mitzvah? No, not if it's a positive mitzvah. Only 20%. It's the max. Should a person be so thrifty that they never give tzedakah? Of course not. Should a person not give tzedakah to a poor person who's going to just walk into a, if let's say you know for a fact, I'm just, I'm not saying this is a real example, but just theoretically, into a liquor store to buy liquor for himself. Maybe you could argue yes, but let's just pretend for the sake of argument the answer is no. Should you be generous in that at that moment? He see, Chazanish argues there's no such thing as good or bad. It's all how it's utilized. All how it's used. A husband and wife are meant to be physically intimate regardless of age. True or false? You turn 65, you're supposed to move into separate bedrooms. True? Of course not. Please don't ask me why I even bring that up. Okay. You, Husband and wife, you're meant to be physically intimate. The Gemara tells us that that um, the Gemara tells us that Avodah and that is the evil inclination for the evil impulse, the urge to worship strange gods, was so powerful for us that it was destroying the Jewish people. And so the Sanhedrin prayed to Hashem to get rid of the Avodah the Yitzhara for Avodah Zarah, which Hashem did. And then they said, why, why, gosh, wow, that was effective prayer. Let's try again. Sexual immorality is such a powerful force ruining the Jewish people. Let's pray to God that he gets rid of the Sahara for sexual immorality. You all heard this Gemara before? So they davened and God got rid of the Sahara. And the Gemara tells us the chickens stopped laying eggs. The chickens stopped laying eggs. Children stopped being born. They weren't being conceived. The Yitzhahara is a vital force. It's just a question of how it's used. You know, this, this um, what's the word, iconography? You know, the, like these icons that we're so used to from Christian sources, the comics. I love the comic strip growing up. I would read the sports and the comics, that was it. My father used to read the weather, okay. I think it was called the metro section. I don't even know if it still exists anymore. Okay. But the comics, right? So the Yitzhar Tov is on this shoulder with a halo, right? Yeah, the Yitzhar is on this shoulder with another, you know, with, with, I don't know, forked horns or whatever it is instead of a halo. I don't know exactly how they depict it. It's not right. It's all one okay. vital force. It's a question of how it's used. Okay. The Rambam writes, that the mitzvot are God's instructions and advice for living and improving our character. To help us overcome our negative inclination and to correct our traits. 
He says, most laws of the Torah are instruction from afar, from the great advisor, so to say, to help us correct our character traits and straighten our ways. Now, it's not always obvious how that is. But certainly, let's just take laziness for a moment, okay? Now, I don't know if laziness is really the right term here. But I worked with a, a boy this past week who told me, I was asking him about, it, about his experience for Shabbat with his family. And he told me that he, um, he went to bed Friday night after the meal. And then he woke up on Saturday night. He's not even a teenager. I mean, yeah, he's 13, barely a teenager. Did he keep Shabbos? I mean, he didn't violate the Shabbos, I guess, right? But did he keep Shabbos? Hard to argue that he really kept the Shabbat, isn't it? I don't know if I want to call that laziness. I don't know, whatever you want to call it, whatever label you want to put on it, right? Zman Kriyashma which is the mitzvah to recite the Shema before three hours into the day, which today was at 9.30 maybe? I'll tell you exactly in a moment. Today's Mount Kriyashma was at, wow, I'm good, 9.30, <laughs> 9.30. I'm not in the mood to get out of bed. The Torah forces you to overcome laziness and forces you out of bed. That's such a simple, over, overly simplistic example, isn't it? But it's true. The Torah tells us, you want to be selfish? You want to think about yourself? You know, when it comes to your relationship with your wife, you have to love her like you love yourself, but respect her even more. How do you respect your wife more than you respect yourself? What does that mean? So do you know how, and I know it can go both ways. I know some women are slobs and some men are slobs, I know. But let's just pretend only men are slobs, okay? Do you know how some guys would be perfectly okay with dirty laundry all over their floor? Or even clean laundry all over their floor? I'm not pointing any fingers or mentioning any names. I don't know anybody like that myself. But just potentially, theoretically, you know how some guys might be like that? So I'll tell you a great story about that in a second. So, so a guy says, look, I love my wife like I love myself. I respect her like I respect myself. I put my socks on the floor and what do I? So, so she doesn't like it. I, for my own self-respect, it doesn't bother me, so it shouldn't bother her. That's not the mitzvah. The mitzvah is respect her more than you respect. Honor her more than you honor yourself. How do you do that? That means you have to respect and honor what she wants, her levels of her, what she considers to be honor and honor worthy or respect worthy, if you will. And therefore, if she does not want to have dirty laundry on the floor, you may not do that. It's a function of Nechad de Yosem Megufa. A lady once told me, I'm not going to say who it is, a lady once told me that uh, when she first got married, she noticed that her husband left his socks on the floor. So when she was cleaning the room, she left them there. And then the next day, he noticed him on the floor. He says, gee, hon, what's, what are my socks? What are those socks doing on the floor? And she goes, I don't know. I guess that's where you left them. <laughs> I guess that's where you left them. And you know what she said? He never left his socks on the floor again after that. And what would have happened if she would have picked up after him? She'd still be picking up after him. Okay. So the Torah requires us to go beyond ourselves. The regular mitzvot of the Torah. Let's see, I have a question here. Um, yeah, Jerry's asking, maybe Yitzhahara traits that you speak of really should be called Yitzhahara Hateva. Yeah, that's why it's interesting. You know, I don't even know where the term Yitzhahara comes from, but if you learn Hasidus and you can talk to any Lubavitcher about this, I believe that the Balatanya has a lot to say about the Nefesh HaBahamis. It's like the lower soul, right? It's, it's, which is nature. It's nature. But yeah, but you know, sometimes nature could be positive or nature could be uplifting. You know, some people's natures are, are different.
Abraham Tversky uses a famous medrash to bring across this point. Gemara, the medrash tells us that when Moshe ascended to heaven to receive the Torah, the angel said to God, why do you want to give the Torah to the people? They're certainly going to transgress it. Don't give it to them. Keep it here us, amongst us, amongst the angels. And not while he's here. Pardon me for a second. Oh. Oh. Yosef, you want to say goodnight to everybody? Yeah. Okay. Say goodnight. Say hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. Say, have a good night. Have a good night. I'll see you all. Later. 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 Done. Done. Okay, bye. <laughs> see you. You're going to go with Mama now. Oh. Mama is Okay. Sorry, hold on a second. Okay. That interlude was brought to you by Pampers. Okay. Um, so Abraham Tversky says that this this Gemara, where the angels are saying, "Why would you give the Torah to humanity?" Why would you give the Torah to the Jews? They're only going to mess it up. And so God says to Moshe, listen, they have a good argument. So you have to, uh, you have to respond to them. So Moshe says, okay. Torah says you shouldn't covet your neighbor's belongings. Are you capable of desiring something that belongs to another angel? And then he lists a whole bunch of different prohibitions. Or, and he asks them, and also Pazakonans as well. And he basically proves to the angels that it's irrelevant to them. So Moshe demonstrated the Torah can only be given to mere mortals because its laws don't apply. They're not relevant for angels. The Medjish tells us that we're given the Torah with its many prohibitions, says Rabbi Tversky, precisely because we have the desires for the things and acts that are forbidden. And so in observance of the Torah, we restrain ourselves from its prohibitions, very often by suppressing the unacceptable drives. That's one way of talking about it. I, I, I've discussed this with Dr. Fox on many occasions. You have certain people who have a propensity for things which are illegal, immoral, wrong. And without getting into whether or not they're born like that, they brought themselves to it, take God forbid a, a pedophile, okay? What, what, what would a pedophile argue to you? He's attracted to children, and therefore, therefore what? That should give him license to act on it. He's not responsible. He's not responsible. So, in my, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to get political and talk about homosexuality and all everything like that. But and clearly, the Torah says certain things are prohibited. Correct. And. And yet you see people feel that they're attracted or whatever it might be. So when you have a person who says, listen, I want to keep the Torah, but I have a natural drive towards polygamy, right? I'm attracted to many women and therefore I'm not responsible. Yeah, tell that to your wife. Good luck, right? So, but what happens? A guy comes into therapy and says, I am attracted to whatever it is. And he says, I, I don't want to act on my attraction. I know it's not okay, whether it's because it's going to harm the child or whatever it might be, or because the Torah says it's prohibited, whatever rationale they're going to use, okay? So for that person, and I, hope, uh, I hope everyone here tonight can handle this kind of conversation. It's a little bit heavy. Um, or disturbing, but for that person, so there's different levels, right? Isn't there? There is being attracted, and then there's thinking about it, and then there's fantasizing about it, and then there's acting on it. And there's all kinds of different levels. And the job that the Torah has given the person is to cut it off at the head and to not go from one 
kind of modality to the next. Everything is available on the internet nowadays. And you can live vicariously through someone else's horrible behavior. But obviously, we're not supposed to do that, right? So if a person comes in and says, I'm already fantasizing about it, it's a whole different ballgame. The guy says, I'm attracted. Okay, you have a natural attraction. And therefore, when you feel attracted, shut it down. And you think, and you turn, learn it, you teach them how to control his thoughts. But for someone who says, I'm already fantasizing about it, or I'm watching, God forbid, child pornography, or I'm, or I'm acting on it, or it just, you know, everyone has their own. But what the Torah does is it requires us to retrain, restrain ourselves. That's what Abitorsky is saying over here. I'm sorry to use such a kind of a stark sort of example. Abitorsky is saying that, that in observance of the Torah, we restrain ourselves from its prohibitions by suppressing our unacceptable drives. So that's one way of thinking about it. Another way to think about it is that there's also the possibility of channeling these drives towards desirable goals. And rather than simply suppressing them, using their energy for positive accomplishments. Now, in some, in some cases, it's impossible, like probably the ones I just mentioned. And there, really, we're supposed to uproot them. But, but um, there are times when the guitar should be used for the good, you know? Be lazy when it comes to uh, going doing something wrong. Again, that's kind of a simplistic sort of one. Okay. Um, earlier, we mentioned from the Mishael Sisharim and from others, how Torah study itself could impact on a person's traits and cause them to develop a more refined character. And the Chazonish writes that the Torah serves to perfect our character traits in two distinct ways. One way is following halacha, teaching us discipline like we talked about before. And the second is that the study of the Torah connects our souls to a higher spiritual realm, and that itself, you know, refines us. Now, obviously, there's different levels of learning Torah. You can learn Torah lishma for its own sake, to be connected to those higher spiritual levels, to be connected to Hashem. If somebody learns Torah to, for honor, whatever, you know, it's not going to have the same impact on people. But I want to read to you from the Chazanish. Chazanish was a rabbi who was originally from Lithuania, moved to Israel. And I believe he died in the 1950s, but he was one of the Jewish Talmudic uh, sages, leaders of the Jewish people. So he talks about both aspects. The practice of being particular in the performance of halachic details, which goes against a person's natural leanings, creates a habit of placing the staff of rule in the hand of wisdom and the reins in the hand of the mind. His, his, his sefer is called the Muna B'tachon. It's written very poetically, and this is translated also somewhat poetically. It empowers the heart to be continuously subdued to his inner sense and his higher conscience, conditions him to become a man of spirit, utterly distant from all vulgarity. If the Torah corrects character traits by virtue of its toil, and by the acquisition of its wisdom, as the laws of the spirit dictate, there's a further aspect of the Torah, a light beyond human cognition. This special light cleanses a person's soul, sensitizes, sensitizes him to taste the subtleties of wisdom and the pleasantness of light. He therefore loves humility by nature and conversely hates haughtiness. He loves kindness and hates cruelty, loves patience and hates anger. For the entire being and desire of a wise person is to correct his character traits and is greatly distressed by his bad inclinations. A wise person feels no greater pain than when he stumbles in a base character trait and feels no greater joy than the joy of correcting his character traits. Uh, today, when I was at the funeral, as I was waiting for, um, for it to begin, Rabbi Shlomo Goldberg was sitting behind me and um, and we're talking about, you know, what do you say to somebody who loses a baby? And, and I shared with him something that I had written, a text message to an acquaintance of mine, fellow I know, 
Not related to our shul. Lost a baby to SIDS. I don't remember exactly when this was, a few, a number of months ago. I only know this fellow through baseball. I've played baseball with him on occasion. We're on the same chat. That's forums games every now and then, though not lately, unfortunately. And I wrote him a text message that basically said, you know, we don't know each other very well, just through baseball. I want you to know that I'm thinking about you and your family. There are no words that I can use and I have no idea what to say, but I want you to know that I'm with you and thinking about you and care about you. And I'm davening to Hashem that you get the strength to get through this. That's it. And halfway through the funeral, I realized that there was another friend, actually a guy I'm fairly friendly with sitting right next to Rabbi Goldberg. I've been talking to Rabbi Goldberg also. And I realized I did not show him my phone. I didn't show him that text message. And I wondered, did he feel left out? And how could I be so insensitive to just show it to one of them and not to the other when they're sitting there as a group? And Baruch Hashem, I was, I'm grateful to Hashem that immediately after the, we escorted the hearse down the alley a little bit, I happened to be standing and walking next to this fellow and I apologized to him. Stumbling in a character trait, feeling great joy at being able to correct a character trait. I am in no way this person the Chazanish is talking about, but I... But I understand a little bit of what he's talking about. Someone is saying that having a good role model helps in fighting the Yitzhahara. That's really interesting. I, I, having a good role model to fight the Yitzhahara. I think it's very rare to find someone who will be honest and open with you about what their struggles are with the Yitzhahara and how they've overcome it. I think, and you can ask Myrna, she'll know all about this. Myrna's on here, Andy's on here, members of the Musarvad. I think that's a part of what they're doing in the Musarvad is they're discussing their character and, and you know, the Yitzhahara, so to say, their, their inclination to, um, that gives them, you know, when, where their challenge in that particular Mida or when where that Voda is and how they overcome it. Andy, does that sound right? And so there, you know, you have role models. Outside of that kind of setting, it's rare for someone to be open and honest, I think. I mean, you could hope, maybe not. Um, uh, uh, Jerry, you want to say something? I have, to, I have to unmute you, though. Jerry, you're muted, I'm sorry. But I find deeply interesting what you say is not only what the, the character, the Ithara characteristics of ourselves, but our, how we relate to the Ithara characteristics of others. Is it one of Sovlanut, of tolerance, acceptance, uh, or you cut them out? I'm sure halachically there's a lot of advice how to handle that. Is that Absolutely. Right? Yeah, the Mishnah says to us, have you done it? Kala Adam Likav Sechut, which means you should judge everybody favorably. And the Mishnah also teaches us, Al Tadinit Chavarachatigilim Komo, don't judge a person until you reach his place. Now, you can never reach a person's place. So, why does the other Mishnah say you should judge people favorably? The answer is, God knows our nature is to judge people, and He says you should try not to. But if you're going to judge them, then at least judge them favorably. Is there a mitzvah to judge someone favorably who you know has wronged you in the past? No. Is there a mitzvah to judge someone favorably as a reputation of being a Russia, of being somebody who doesn't deserve the benefit of the doubt? Of course not. So, you know, it all, it all, it all depends. But certainly if you see somebody doing something that you think to be wrong, you definitely are encouraged to try to judge them favorably. I want to share, I want to share a, 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 another, another uh, um, it's an anecdote so much as something I heard today at the funeral. The little boy who died, his name was Nehemiah Matasyahu. Matasyahu was named after Rav Matas Bloom. He's written a, a, many, many svarim called Torah Ladas. He was renowned as a Talmud Chacham. But what the, what the, uh, the boy's grandfather said was that he, he had an outstanding midos, unusually outstanding character. We actually knew him. He died, I think, of COVID last year, unfortunately. We knew him. His wife, Sharon, is very good friends with my mother-in-law. They were 
It was a second marriage for both of them. Uh, their, their spouses had previously passed away and, uh, and they married each other. Uh, but they, they weren't married very long, I think three, four years. And then unfortunately, like I said, he passed away from COVID. Um, his, his, apparently at his first wife's funeral, he stopped and he went over to the police escort. He thanked them. He went over to the security guard. He thanked them. He went over to the valet people. He thanked them. I'd be like, what are you doing? Because that's who he was. He, he was just a tremendous human being. And even at his own wife's funeral, that's what he was worried about. That's, those are, that's midos that we can learn from. The, the, or, the Orchel Sadiqan says that if you don't possess refined character traits, then you don't have Torah and mitzvos. You know, for the entire Torah, it depends on the refinement of character traits. And, and so yeah, like I quoted from the Vilna Gaon before, the purpose of life is to develop our character. And then finally, the Chassan Sofer, Reb Moshe Sofer writes that God doesn't want us to be hermits. He wants us to interact with others, share our Torah knowledge. He says, it's not God's will that a person should be isolated. They should go to an uninhabited place, to the desert or forests, contemplate and think about the great acts of God, who is great. No, the world was not created to be desolate. He formed it to be inhabited. That's from Isaiah 45, 18. The will of God is to love people, to connect with them, to teach them in the understanding and wisdom of God's Torah. This is the goal of perfecting our character. So we can interact with other people in a, in, in a very, very beautiful sort of way. So this is a leading a life of spirituality. It's people who have perfected, so to say, people who have worked on themselves and their development and their growth so that they are people that are refined people are people that are extraordinary people. And these are people I want to hang out with. These are people I want to call my friends. And this is a spiritual life. But this ends this shir for tonight. And we can leave it here. My bracha to everybody. Miriam, I want you to stay on for a moment. And I also, um, Eitana, if you're still on, I want you to stay on as well at the end, please, for a moment. Um, but I, I do... Um, I, I do appreciate everybody correcting me in the chat here is what I'm looking at. Um, I, do, <laughs> I do appreciate everybody joining us tonight, even if it was, uh, if we got started a little bit later than usual. So I thank you and thank you for your comments and thank you so much for your um, participation this evening. I wish you all a fabulous, wonderful night and Lila Tov, Shavua Tov and Lila Tov. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Okay. And Thank Miri you. Miriam, can we get an update on your husband? Or not, whatever you're comfortable with. Or not.